in talking about what makes a true partner. Hello, Siraj and Michelle. Good morning. Good morning. How are you both? Yeah, doing fine. Good, wow, good, good. You. Good, good, good. I'm glad. So let's ask you the same question that we asked uh, Claire to start off that. We'll start with you, Michelle. Michelle, we're going to talk about obviously kind of, you know, it's, it's inevitable we're going to talk about this strange year and what impact it's had, particularly around your partnership and all those sorts of things. What impact has it had on you? What have you learned about your own leadership skills, Michelle? Well, I'll tell, I'll tell you, you have to learn how to, how to pivot, right? How to think on your feet and how to make sure that you also have a way of staying close to the consumer, because this is something that we have never experienced before. And so um, we need to make sure we were keeping our ear to the ground and understanding what our consumers were going through, how they were reacting, and then how that impacted us, what we could do to help um, no to help our consumers. And I can, I can just cool. leave this now, right? And Sarah, same question to you, sir. How has it impacted your leadership? Star, what have, what have you learned about yourself through this period? Oh, it's my God. Both. Obviously, I'm just going to conclude, right? I, Sorry, I Sarah, there's some the audio post. interference in there. Could we stop that, please? Thank you. Sarah, continue. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's at a many different levels when you talk about leadership, right? It's about how do you keep your teams motivated at a time like this when you can't obviously meet with them in person. Um, it's about my own way of managing. Like, you know, my life was on the road. Literally for 26 years, I was on the road three or four days a week meeting with the clients, being on stage, being out there in public forums and so forth. And I've had to completely change that whole modality in being able to manage all of that remotely. And that is, that's a hard thing to do, but we've managed it quite well. I mean, you know, we've come a long way here in the last six to seven months. This almost feels like normal to me at this point. So yeah, we are, we are fine. We are managing just, uh, just well at this point. Good. I'm glad. But the reason why I wanted to start there is because obviously what we're talking about here is what makes a true partner. How do you stay closer to your clients, to your partners, but, you know, to, to your customers, to everybody? How are you a better partner up and downstream? Uh, and I think that, you know, the pandemic has put pressure on that situation. So let's start, if we can, with a, um, with a definition, if you don't mind. Um, what do you think what would be your definition of a true partner, Michelle? What does it mean to you? Well, first off, I have to say open communication, being able to um, talk about what's happening with the partnership, whether it's good or bad, you know, knowing that the agency is not going to put a spin on the bad news and as well as, you know, talk about the good news. I would say um, a partner that comes with some innovation. As you said, we're experiencing abnormal times, so we have to be able to be flexible and pivot, not just to try to true things that they already know having worked, and then um, a partner that um, you can trust and has the experience that you need to get you through these times. Thank you much indeed. Sarah, same question to you, sir. So I would say that uh, the, 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 the fundamentals of any relationship when it comes to a client, especially related to advertising and marketing, whoever the partner is, expertise and experience in the vertical category is the foundation. You have to know the industry, the business inside and out to be able to add any significant value. Uh, and in this particular case, of course, relevant within the digital space because a significant movement has happened towards digital here in consumer behavior, right? Um, the second part is the chemistry. You know, I've been in the client services business long enough now to know that uh, we as providers, as service providers or technology providers, are frankly going to be as good or capable of providing the best of what we can as long as there is a receptive client who really is eager, is curious, wants to learn, and wants to really move uh, rapidly. And I think that level of chemistry is extremely critical. So we can be great, <laughs> doesn't really matter 
I learned a lot. I mean, there has to be a strong client on the other side who has a clear picture, clear understanding of where they want to go. And I think there's a lot of goodness that can actually happen. And I agree with everything that Michelle actually said. I think there are many, many things that are needed now than, than what the one had ever anticipated, frankly, before this year. I mean, we, we are in very uncertain ground as we are living with, and every week is different. And you need to have teams that can be very agile, can move fast, can think quickly. All of those things, uh, and especially in digital medium that moves rapidly and innovation sort of is kind of coming at us from the fire hose. Uh, you just have to be prepared. So we've got, you know, expertise and innovation and that, that sort of, you know, that, that open communication, I guess that sort of lack of a blame culture, Michelle, the, the, the ability okay. to just talk openly without it becoming down to finger pointing unnecessary horribleness, which tends to put a big glob in things. Um, so it, now we know that, can you explain the background to your partnership? And I don't know which of you would like to go first uh, in this. Uh, Let's the Raj start. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. So, so I was introduced to Michelle uh, through the CEO of DSE, um, and frankly, I've had a delightful relationship with uh, Moez, who is the CEO, and he and I have actually worked together on multiple pro bono assignments in East Africa and Central Asia in the past. And we never ever really talked about the business I was in, nor did I really ever ask him about what he did until about two years ago, we were at a dinner in Washington DC and he just asked me, it's like, what do you do? And, and I started inquiring about his business and we got on to discussing about his challenges and how he sees you know, the movement from physical retail and the limitations there and how he would like to explore the digital environment and e-commerce and all of that. And I, 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 I was all year because that's essentially what I have done, frankly, for a quarter century. And so we just hit it off and we spent like two and a half hours that one evening, we were there till midnight and he invited me and that's sort of got us started. And I got introduced to Michelle and sort of we've been at it for the past, whatever, over 12 months now. Michelle? Yeah, so as you can imagine from my end, if you've ever been in a situation where your CEO comes to you and says, I've got this close personal friend and he's head of this agency and you know, I want you to take a look, you don't know whether he's saying that with a wink and a nod and saying, you, you, you better use these guys, this is my close personal friend, or whether he's really asking you to evaluate them. Um, to make sure they're a good fit for the organization. But, you know, Siraj is being humble. He has such um, expertise and credibility as one of the founders of Digitas, which I knew when I was growing up at J&J &J and um, over there, Digitas was one of the first digital media agencies that we knew of in consumer health. And then he has a lot, um, second company, Visible Measures, who used to, who sort of was nascent in the digital media measurement um, uh, area. And so he had a lot of deep expertise in digital, in media, and also now at Acuity, a very tech savvy shop with uh, media expertise in our, in our categories, in consumer packaged goods. So once I learned all about them and their background, I was very happy that he happened to be a, a personal friend of the CEO. And so that's how we got started. And what about the, you know, we, we talked about that, that kind of openness. So and rest assured, I'm not going to ask you, you know, if things gone wrong or get you to, to wash your dirty laundry in public or anything like that. But, um, but how, did you, how did you start mapping out that relationship then? What did those initial sort of, you know, meetings and, and setting out and this is what we want to achieve. Okay, well, this is what we can do. And how did that bit work? Well, you know, we, so first of all, I, I needed um, Siraj to really understand the challenges that we were going through. You know, when we were 99% in traditional retail model, we have brands at Walmart and CVS. And so whenever the, um, those traditional retailers have problems, they become our problems, right? So in addition to the consolidation of retail, um, those retailers were trying to make up for their profitability from, you know, turning to services, um, you know, turning to the clinics at, in their stores, giving more shelf space to private label and getting profitability there. So we were being squeezed and we had to find another revenue source 
for growth and that we were looking to digital for that. So we were at the beginning and we needed a partner and an ecosystem that would help us understand really, you know, what marketplaces were we going to play on? How do we come to market as a digital brand, which is different from the brick and mortar that we were used to? And how are consumers going to find us now? We were used to traditional problem solving, problem solution advertising through broadcast media. And that as, as a uh, place to play in media was also shrinking. So we needed a partner that was going to help us overcome those challenges, as well as take us into the digital realm successfully. Thank you much, Steve. Uh, Saj, uh, I'm sure you know the phrase, you know, um, give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day, teach him to fish and you'll feed him for his life. How, how much of the, the relationship then is about solving a problem immediately and how much of it, you know, in, in light of what Michelle talked about there, is actually about getting people to look at the problem more holistically and, and begin to talk about skill set change and where this is all going? So this is a this this is really profound. It's an amazing question. I could speak for an hour on this topic, but we will we will get to it shortly here. Uh, the, uh, the first order business is I tell you, a curious client who is eager to learn everything and anything there is about what we were beginning to face together is frankly eighty percent of the battle in general. I mean, I've dealt with hundreds of clients in the past. And this is one place where I noticed that the entire senior team is just so eager. They have tons of questions every single time we actually met or spoke uh, online. And what that, that told me essentially was that not only were we expected to plan and execute but we needed to bring this client along with us in making sure that they could connect to what was their main course of strategy for the business, right? Because they understand their business better than we do. And so while we can execute, we needed to make sure that what we were trying to accomplish was fully aligned with where they needed their business to be in the next 12 to 18 months and beyond. And so I think it was a real parallel track in terms of every session was a balance of mm -hmm. here is what we are saying or recommending, but here are the five reasons why we are recommending it be done this way. And that turned out to be the modus operandi on everything we did. And I have to tell you, I'm really impressed. I mean, Michelle is very generous. She said some very nice thing about me, but I have to tell you, if it wasn't for a client like this, who was so eager and into it and determined to success, uh, it, this could not have gotten as far as we have gotten with the team here. Absolutely, thank you very much indeed. So, you know, so I'm, I'm curious because what we hear a lot at the moment is, you know, people saying, uh, I'm demanding more from my partners. You know, everybody is struggling at the moment and I need more. And therefore, I need more from my team. I need more from my people, but I need more from my partners. So it, it feels to me, Saraj, that in fact, your relationship was already at that point, regardless of the pandemic. You were always, it was always a, a, an holistic solution. This, yes, absolutely. And, and, uh, and Michelle, please talk about it because you are the one who literally put the brief in front of me, the way you described it, in terms of what you were looking for in the next phase of what you needed to accomplish and why you couldn't get there before we started talking. Right, so we had, we had experienced, you know, we were actively pursuing, we were, I should say, passively pursuing digital, but not really actively pursuing digital before we met Siraj. So we had experiences with a couple of agencies that, you know, did part of the consumer journey. So, you know, we'd have a digital media agency that focused on one area. We may have a search agency. We may have bits and pieces. But when we came to Siraj, we said we need a holistic solution that's going to take us from when you, where you find the consumer, who they are, making sure it's very, very targeted, that we're interrupting their consumer journey, and we're going to be able to measure that all the way through to the sale. 
So although we, we get that you are a media agency, we need partners that can help us go through the entire consumer journey together. And Siraj was able to bring in partners that could help us do the whole thing. I mean, we were, you know, talking about how do we make sure we're on Amazon, because clearly that's where the tonnage is, um, Walmart.com. How do we engage with DTC? We all know that, you know, Google is going to be taking away cookies at some point in the future. So we need to get all the way to attribution and the actual sale. And Siraj was able to bring all those pieces together so that when we went to market, we got the whole consumer journey. That was really important to us. Yeah, I think, Adam, that really, if I may build on that for a second, uh, that was the first challenge that was put at our doorstep, which was it had to be a turnkey single partner solution. I don't want piecemeal stuff. Well, you know, Adam, as it is true in our business, agencies instantaneously claim they can do everything, regardless of where their roots are or what their DNA is, right? I've learned that the hard way in the past, no single partner can do everything. It's not possible. You may be able to, but you won't be good at everything. Mm -hmm. So given that I realized it up front and I was very open with Michelle, I said, look, we are the masters of managing the consumer journey. We are the masters of really managing programmatic, precision targeting, efficiency, all of that. But you know what? You want to build a powerful e-commerce site. You want to have an amazingly strong presence on Amazon. You want to optimize the Amazon algorithm and use the Amazon DSP and all of that. We can't do everything, but I'll find you the partners who will come to the table together and we will give you a single solution end to end, right? And that's the way we managed it. It's all about being honest. It's all about being open. It's about being telling the client what you can do and what you can't do and what you can't do here is how I'm going to find an alternative for you so that it feels like you can keep moving forward. Thank you very much, Steve. Now, I do have many more questions, obviously, for Sarah and Michelle, but this isn't about my questions. It's about your questions. So please do raise your virtual hands uh, and our producers are watching will bring you straight up and get you straight involved in the conversation. Um, so, Michelle, I'm, I'm curious then. So, you know, you, you said this is not something that at the time you were kind of, you know, you were good at. Th therefore, you wanted this sort of turnkey solution to come in. Uh, all of a sudden, you've got to manage all of this, regardless of whether or not, you know, you need to do the work. I get it, you know, but, but managing it is a complex type thing. It's, it, 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 there's a lot of communication. Where did you need to pivot? Where were, where were the challenges for you? What skills did you need to pick up? Well, um, that's a good question because you're right. It's, it takes a lot of incremental time and energy to put some focus behind this because I can tell you one of the things we, we, we should have done, we should have done better. We brought our whole brick and, so, brick and mortar mindset to digital. And what we should have done is we should have took it as a blank slate and make sure that we understand, okay, now we're going into a marketplace that operates on different terms. This, this marketplace has different economics. This marketplace has a different competitive set. So um, one of the things we really needed to do as a team was educate ourselves um, on what digital requires and how it was different. And also, if there's anything that's the same, you know, obviously in, in brand marketing anywhere, you still have to have a brand with a very strong positioning, unique in a consumer's mind, and um, and and able to differentiate itself regardless of whether you're on the, the shelf um, on brick and mortar or whether you're on the digital shelf and understanding all the differences that that requires. Absolutely. There, there have been, Adam, I will tell you if I may add, so there have been some amazing learnings because the complexity of going into digital and transforming your business from what is traditionally physical retail is a massive undertaking because what is happening is consumers have many choices, as Michelle is pointing out. You can go to a marketplace like Amazon or Walmart. You can actually go use shoppable media on Facebook or Instagram and actually start buying stuff directly from the catalog off of a brand's provided you know, experience and access. Or you can actually deal directly with the brand as people go to Nike, frankly. 35% of Nike's business comes online direct to consumer, right? You could do that too. 
given this level of choice framework that's out there, understanding what each access point provides to a consumer is a monumental effort. You really have to understand clearly what each of those things are uniquely suited to provide and why consumers go to those places. And I think those things are just amazing things that every brand should really put and do some homework before they really go crazy about it's digital. Thank you very much indeed. In fact, we do have a question from our audience. So let's see who that is. I think, is it Tom from like Tom Kelly. Hello, Tom, how are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you, sir. What's your question, sir? Um, as you talk about the nature of the relationship between both of your entities, client and agency, how do you have difficult decisions? Um, you know, we deal with a lot of partners uh, in a lot of different fields um, across the Nike matrix, whether it's a wholesale partner that we're giving bad news to, or it's an agency partner that we're changing the brief on. I would just be curious to see the nature of the relationship and how you have difficult decisions based on your partnership. The great, it's what we want to get to, isn't it? The, the, the guts of the matter. How do you deal with all the horrible stuff? Michelle, you want to touch it or you want me to yeah, take it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I wish I had a, a better answer. Just you go straight at it. You go directly at it. I mean, when you develop the, the uh, a relationship with folks, you have to be able to deal with both sides of the equation. So you got to be honest. I mean, if you're up front in the beginning and letting people know what the goals are, right? For us, we, we were talking about if, if whatever we're doing doesn't have an impact on growing our sales, then it doesn't make sense for us. I mean, there's a lot of test and learning we can do, but if it's not growing our sales, we're not interested in it. And so we, we measured everything. And once you have that dashboard, if stuff is not working, we all as a team got together and said, look at the numbers, like the data doesn't lie. This is not working. So we all want this to move forward. And um, it's not working because this specific area. So you put a spotlight on a place where it's not working. That may be a specific vendor and say, you know, what can you do? How can you help us get past this? And then we think about it as a team. We don't try to, you know, shame that one particular vendor. We think about it as a team. How can we overcome these challenges? So I think it's best to be open and direct about what's happening and have all the data to be able to back up the decisions. Yeah, but I think as a partner, long before a client needs to actually raise an issue, it's up to the partners, it's up to the vendors to be able to come out and say, here are the three things we did. Here are the things that didn't work. We recommend we follow this particular track. I think this is all about being proactive. I don't think every solution provider actually does that. I ran Digitas for 14 years, I know that there are certain partners who just simply do not accept that fact that they could have any issues. And I think it's about being ahead of the game. You always have to be two steps ahead of the client to be able to really move the agenda forward. Thank you, Rush Dude. Uh, any of that resonate with you, Tom? What, what, are you, what are you kind of seeing in that area? Absolutely, I think, I think, you know, like a consumer relationship, an agency relationship is based on authenticity. And that's gonna set up, um, the nature of any conversation you need to have, uh, whether it's you know good news or bad news, and so that that resonates pretty deeply on this end. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, much appreciated, sir. I think up next we have Sonia Barris from Walt Disney. Sonia, are you there? Yes. Hey, Sonia, how are you? Good. Good. What is your question? So I yeah, I wanted to ask, how involved were you as the client in the messaging? So as the media landscape was changing and the need to shift and reevaluate where your media was going, you know, you mentioned Amazon and and how involved were you in between the agency and vendor um, in changing your messaging, knowing that you were changing also your placement? Um, and And how important was that internally as far as shifting your messaging, knowing that this new normal that we're in. Thank you, Sonia. Michelle, we'll start with you, if we may. Sure. So um, as, as a client and as a brand owner, we own the messaging, right? So we, are, we were highly involved and highly engaged in, in everything that we were talking about for our brands. Um, we, as everybody else did, when, when COVID happened, we had just finished, right in February, finished a new ad that we were about to launch. And um, 
once COVID broke, we looked at the, the the advertising. It was the it was a day in the life, right? So it happened to be a day in the life in a city. So we were showing crowded offices. We were showing um, the commute to work. So they're on a crowded train, and we said, oh, "Great ad, but it totally doesn't work today." So immediately, what we did is we we edited those scenes out of it and see if we could still have an ad that stayed together but still made sense in a, in a COVID um, environment. The product still made sense because it was healthcare related and it was a product that was actually needed. And um, I give credit to Siraj in terms of, he, he said to us, you know, listen, uh, this is a time to lean in, to spend more media because we've adapted the messaging to make it resonate to the con consumer um, and, and make sure we're not seeing tone deaf, but it's now a time to lean in and advertise more than we normally would have because a lot of people are pulling back like hospitality and travel. They weren't advertising anymore. The prices got better, got cheaper. Um, and so we did, we leaned in and we ended up having one of the top 10 healthcare ads um, and that was uh, previewed in ad, ad age. And that was a execution that Siraj helped us do, but the messaging was changed for the moment and it was successful. Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. Uh, Saraj, I would just like to hear your, your kind of point of view on this, I think, because absolutely right, it's Michelle's brand. She owns the brand, she owns the messaging. But you know the media better. Um, so it, it, there, there must be an element to which you, you, you can say, I get what you're trying to say, but, but maybe use a different format or a different style or a different language for this particular media. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, the changing the messaging obviously had to be done the way Michelle described it. It, it, it just wouldn't have worked otherwise. The, the, the more important part in this was that the decision was made for it to be video because it was a very new positioning for the brand that was going to connect with something to do with screen time and so forth, which was coming on. I'm a, I mean, from a timing perspective, we couldn't have done better. This was literally a miracle in the happening for this brand. And so what we had to do is literally hand the media over to the people so that the consumer can own the brand. That was essentially our goal. We wanted the consumer to literally look at that video, that message, own it and share it like crazy. Mm. That's what we wanted to do. And the timing was perfect from that perspective to be able to do the video the way we did it. And the reason it made it the top 10 was exactly that. That people absolutely connected with that because the timing was perfect. You see what I'm saying is, I don't care how smart we are and how strategic we are and how everything we are. The fact of the matter is once in a while, we do in fact get lucky. In this particular case, we actually got lucky too. You know, Who knew that COVID was going to hit when we were getting ready to launch this brand? Absolutely. Well, secret, great comedy, Saraj. Timing. Um, <laughs> Sonia, uh, thank you very much indeed. I hope that was useful for you. Thank you for your question. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And up next we have Anthony Abernathy from Nike. Anthony, hello, sir. How are you? I'm great. Um, quick question for Michelle. Um, just given the fact with the pandemic, we know that digital was probably accelerated for your, your company. Um, but in order to truly have a great partnership with Siraj, it felt like you needed to truly make him more than a, just a partner. Like he needed to become a part of your workforce and your work team. Um, how open were you with everything that you guys were trying to do? Not just the short term, but the long term in order for Siraj to be honest and transparent around here are the things that he can solve, but then here are the other things that I need to go find other experts in that space to deliver the holistic uh, service that you were asking for. Thank you very much, Tate. Yeah, good question. Um, so we were very open. And you know what? We it was it wasn't a it wasn't a position where we wanted to be arrogant. We were very humble about we don't know this space. <laughs> you know, and we want to, this is a big part of our strategy. So we're a small company, very nimble. So for us, we couldn't become digital first, right? That's not our, that's not our, uh, our history, but we could become digitally focused. 
And so this wasn't, uh, when we talked to Siraj, it wasn't about a one time <laughs> or one year thing. This it is where the effort where we started launching Sorry. the report next year with a large me, research investment which audio feedback. Will be Very published. important for us. And send a note to Robert who will get back to us. I can't see why this wouldn't be mentioned. Yeah, I mean. I'm hearing some other some yes, other voices. I okay, think great. someone wasn't muted on the Zoom call, Michelle. Thank you very much indeed. All sorted now. No worries. But uh, so basically, Anthony, it just was what this wasn't just a, a a couple of month assignment. This was we want some partners in it with us for the long term. Um, we expect for you to pivot and grow with us. We sort of opened our economics to them. Um, we let them be a part of the whole forecast process. And when we all, you know, sort of hold hands and said, this is what we're going to spend to achieve it. This is um, short-term goals. These are long-term goals. Um, because in, in, it, it, you're not going to learn. You, you have to be in it for a longer period of time in order to be successful in digital. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. And you have to be able to overcome those mistakes and then see it through so you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So we're still in it. I don't even want to make it seem like we're not in it. We're still partnering with Siraj to continue to get there and to grow. And so we had to be completely honest with them. And, and I think that was very helpful. Thank you very much, Steve. Anthony, so, I mean, curious, because it, the, the same sort of question back to you, you clearly work with, you know, an awful lot of partners and stuff like that. How do you deal with those kind of things? I think Tom, Tom brought it up a little bit earlier in the first question is sometimes we aren't always completely open because um, we're trying to evaluate if this is the right vendor, right? And so you don't want to necessarily give all of your playbook to somebody that may not necessarily be honest or live up to the expectations that you need from a capability standpoint. So, um, you know, but I think digital now was forcing us to be honest with who we are and the values that we stand for, not only to our customers, but we need to start to do that with our potential agencies. Mm -hmm. And so it's a risk, but I think nowadays it, it's important so that you can truly get to um, a solid working relationship that could be fruitful down the line. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. I'm just you know, going to put that Adam, to Saraj. Yes, sir. Adam, you know, the, the gentleman uh, who from, from Nike who, who is talking about how there is initial sort of hesitance or skepticism, right, between a client and a partner. Should they really disclose everything? Is this, you know, and so forth. Uh, to some extent, having lived through many, many relationships, right, what, what has, what, what has, taught me the most is that trust has to be earned. Clients don't always give you the trust. It's never going to really happen. It's rare. We have to, as a partner, demonstrate to them that there is value in them sharing more information with us. We have to be able to create an environment in which we show here are the things that are possible that we could do if we had this kind of information. And I think that's the kind of setup that motivates many clients to want to partner more actively and be more involved and be more sharing. I see, I agree. And uh, you know, I, I, Anthony, look, I'm sure you, trust has to be earned. I mean, it's exactly the same for you as a brand, isn't it? Trust has to be earned. Uh, everyone's a customer, everyone's a client. Anthony, really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Um, we have one more question, I believe, from Mary Ann at OBI Creative. Hey, Mary, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. What's your question for Siraj and Michelle? My question is a little more tactical, I guess. Um, I'm thinking about the customer experience and the customer journey moving from retail into digital can you talk a little bit about how you thought through sort of the post-sale experience and, um, you know, everything from being able to, you know, I don't know manage out-of-box experience to um, retention tactics or customization? How, how far have you gone kind of on that side and how important do you think that is to your overall digital strategy? Thank you, Maria. Yeah, so Marianne, it's, that's a great question because we're just getting to that right now. <laughs> I wish I would have been had the foresight to think about that more um, at the beginning <clears throat> when we started. But as we were digging more and more into digital, totally understanding and also looking at what the competitive set was doing. You know, obviously we're going to order their products, 
we ordered the products for one of our competitors and saw that they were what they were offering once you got that open that box and the experience that they give the the discounts the promotions just the the emotional feel and expectation once the product was in the home we were like wow we were really missing out here um and just hadn't expected that at all again bringing that brick and mortar mindset over to digital so now we are putting lots of plans in place to make sure that the consumer is can appreciate what we're giving them at home that we're thinking about how they're using the product at home you know how many times they're going to use it right because it's also about lifetime value so you want to make sure you're nurturing them at home so that that next sale and that fourth and fifth sale comes through how what can you do for them um to make that experience better. So we're just getting to the point where we're putting the plans in place to make our brands do better from that perspective. But that's a great question. Thank you very much indeed. Saraj, anything to add, sir? Yeah, I think uh, what, what, I'm, what I was pointing to earlier is that given consumers have so many choices and access points, whether they are going through marketplaces or social platforms or dealing directly with the brand, the question that was asked, you have amazing control over that experience and the continuity and the managing of the journey, generally when you have a direct relationship with the consumer. You don't always get that. You go to a marketplace like Amazon or Walmart, you are not going to have access to customer data. That means you can't really carry the level of relationship you want. You can't necessarily drive the kind of lifetime value that Michelle is actually referring to, right? All of those things can happen beautifully with all of the creative treatments and things you can do if you know enough about the consumer and they are part of your file and you can manage that continuity and that annuity over time. And I think that's the part that many brands actually have not fully understood. Even though the big marketplaces are great in terms of driving revenue velocity, the ROI is necessarily great. You're going to make the more ROI and the LTV literally when you have the customer in your file and you are managing that relationship directly. And I think that's the world in which we live in, where brands can have more control versus less. And how do they manage that? And the ability to really manage that experience consistently is the ongoing challenge that every brand faces. Thank you very much, Steve. Marianne, thank you so much for your question. Really appreciate it. I hope it's the first of many. Thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you. so um, as we sort of, you know, pull this to an end, I suppose, um, I, yeah, let, let's talk about each other. Let's pull it to an end like that. So the, the question I think, you know, it, is what did you learn? So Michelle, what do you think you learned most from Acuity? And then Saraj, what do you think you've learned most from DSE? Michelle, do you like to go first? Wow. Uh, yeah, so one thing is that I, I learned that, um, first of all, I'm very grateful for the relationship that we have with Acuity. They have been um, true partners in the way in which we have went to market with them, and they've educated us a lot along the way. So what we've learned specifically, we've learned about the different medias and the marketplaces and how being very targeted and how getting to know people at the at the digital level can help you learn so much more about your consumer. So we went in with a whole set of hypotheses about our consumer, about what they were doing and who they are, and we came up with another set after we were done testing and learning. So that's, that's a huge thing. Um, we learned from them about really understanding the whole um, consumer journey and, and them being honest about, like we said earlier, what they can and cannot do and bringing their other partners in and leveraging the relationships that they have to make us appear much bigger as a small company than we would normally. Um, we learned the, like the, the, the tactical stuff. What, what is the dashboard that we need to understand? What are the measures that we need to understand? Which mediums work best and in what order? I mean, all of that for us, with them having this broad understanding of media, was helpful to us as a brand who had just really played in a little bit of digital and broadcast media in the past. And um, just what the strength of, of a really good partnership and open communication can bring. So we learned, we learned a ton from them. 
Thank you very much, Steve Thank Michelle. You. And Sarah, same question to you. So what, what have you learned during your, your, your partnership with DSA? Well, I, I learned that the clients uh, usually know a lot more than we do. And uh, what they understand about the business requires us to be really humble. And I learned a big lesson of humility. And I can tell you, even with an ex a specific instance of that, which uh, uh, frankly, if I wanted to promote ourselves, I wouldn't be talking about that. Um, but, but here's the thing, what we learned, right? We have been preaching the power of programmatic advertising for years. And we've done miracles in many, many cases across many different clients uh, in the past. But I have to tell you, this particular client and its brand portfolio offered us some very unique challenges, which we had not necessarily anticipated. And, and, and it, it, was, it was really interesting to see how much the client actually trusted us and gave us the runway to be able to recover from that. And here's a very specific example. So programmatic advertising, you know, for those of you who don't really care to know the technology, underneath all of that is the power of machine learning. Well, machine learning works really well and does beautifully when you have large volumes of data. But guess what? When you're launching some of the brands that are new into the digital space, you don't always have the benefit of volumes of data. The customer base is just growing and building. So we faced some very unique challenges of working with limited data sets, which took us a lot longer to come to the type of performance that we would have wanted to deliver uh, than where we ended up, right? And I think that was one of the things about which we had very open conversation with the client. This is what builds trust. When you tell the client, here were the basic assumptions we started with, and here is the reality of what we face, and here is how we suggest we are going to really manage it accordingly to recover from that. And I think those are the hard lessons that you jointly learn is what builds the bond and the chemistry for the type of relationship we actually have with the DSE team. Thank you very much indeed. Michelle Mohammed, Saraj Bawani, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day, great rest of the summit.